this is the part that nobody talks about. I realized today that I've never talked about the pain that I've lived with my whole life that I was gaslit to believe was part of the normal female experience. It's Saturday, so I have the luxury of being in pain and resting, but I don't have that during the week and no, neither does anyone else um, experiencing this. And whether you're being gaslit uh, that it's periods and they're supposed to be painful, bullshit. Pregnancy, supposed to be painful? No, doesn't have to be. Postpartum, supposed to be a certain way, look a certain way. Birth, supposed to look a certain way. No. The thing is, since women weren't included in medical trials and it wasn't mandated that they be included until the 90s, what do we know about pelvic health for women and identifying issues? It's why women are delayed in endometriosis diagnosis. My mom suffered with it for over a decade before she had surgery, which still was not the cure. This was decades ago, where she received a hysterectomy after suffering a lot unnecessarily. And we know a hysterectomy is not a cure for endometriosis. And so now I am getting ready to embark on the same journey. It's been way more than 10 years. And in many ways, I feel like being a pelvic PT both helped and harmed diagnosis. It didn't harm diagnosis in that it didn't help me. It's what has probably delayed, allowed me to delay um, surgery for this long. But it's not the fault of pelvic PT, and it's not my fault because I'm a pelvic PT and ortho PT. It's the system's fault because I can't count. I'm almost about to lose track. It's hard to remember of the number of surgeries that I've had that were called something else. Not once did they do a biopsy. Did I assume that they would cover that? Of course I did, right? Not my lane, not my swim lane, but it's not the case, it's not true. So if you're having unexplained pain, which I have had and it's been severe, but then I have lots and lots and lots of days that aren't. Um, but I've also had great pain management techniques. I had three births that were unmedicated. Um, I've had multiple, before I had my hip arthroscopy, I had multiple diagnostic inje injections that I did not flinch or barely wince on. I mean, I have a high tolerance for pain. And I think a lot of women do end up with a high tolerance for pain because they're told they have a low tolerance for pain. And then, so you just suffer with it, thinking, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. And so the tipping point for me, and I still don't know what's going on, and I won't know until October the 31st. So that surgery is scheduled. Out of state, out of network, <laughs> out of pocket. And the tipping point of that was April. It's now fall, hence the little fall colors. <laughs> April. The same pain 
jolted me out of bed awake. Uh, that has happened before. Sometimes I could be walking down the street and it stabs. It's stabbing. Abdominal pain. Cramping like you just cannot walk. You cannot stretch out straight. You can't. And I will kneel to the ground, breathe through it. The dog waits on me. I get back up. I keep going. In fact, a lot of times I'm out exercising in order to manage that random pain. That can be anything from respiratory diaphragm, almost like um, se severe spasms. That's not dehydration. <laughs> it's not overexertion. And it's not weakness. I teach this shit for a living. I know what I'm doing. It's not crappy breathing. I, I'm a singer. So I can't be gaslit on that and I won't gaslight myself on it. And then it also feels like you cannot take a breath, like you, like your lung is collapsed. I've been found uh, on the floor, not able to breathe before. That's happened a couple of times. The second time I ended up in the ER because I, I couldn't walk, I couldn't breathe, I had to be carried to the car. The pain transcends on down. It is not a simple so as issue. Um, like I was told when I knew I had a hip labral tear and impingement, I was told it was so as tendonitis. That was also crap. But it took me three more years to get someone to listen. And then lo and behold, I had impingement in three places and a big tear and a bloody, a joint full of blood. So, you know, those, those are, there's tipping points like that. And then it, I'll continue the symptomology on down that, you know, you, you may feel. Um, it is not just a menstrual cramp thing. Uh, it is not confined to the pelvis. Like I have heard multiple OBGYNs say, GI pain, that has nothing to do with gynecological health. Yeah, I actually got that. More gaslighting. Um, but it's not gaslighting if you know it's gaslighting, so. <laughs> um, yes, GI pain, lots of GI pain. Pain that feels like your body's trying to digest something but can't, and it's so painful, like it's peristalsis that's so painful, the movement of the of intestines that it, it, uh, it sends you to the floor. And then the last part of the strange symptoms that are far beyond what you would think with um, endometriosis is nerve pain. That could be pelvic pain. It could be painful intercourse. It could be um, almost sciatic type pain, sciatica type pain, um, saddle, you know, kind of the seat uh, between the legs type pain. Not all of those things have happened. Not all of them have happened at once, uh, particularly for me, but it, I did have incredible nerve pain in the sacral area, but it could also go away. And this is why I say that, you know, pelvic PT is an absolute lifesaver. I couldn't have made it um, without it. I could not have made it without functional medicine that I practice, um, without my team of practitioners that I collaborate with. It couldn't have happened without an integrative medicine because of the therapeutic yoga and the pain management. It couldn't have happened without the lifestyle medicine and the science of addressing all of those six pillars. They're all critical. It allowed me to manage and function and do all kinds of stuff. Uh, boulder climb, horseback ride, um, wakeboarding, snowboarding. I will not be stopped by this. And if it turns out to be endometriosis on the 31st, I will not be stopped by endometriosis, and I never did. But here's the tipping point, y'all. When you end up in the ER, and I just said, I just front-loaded my ER visit. I'm like, look, I didn't say don't jerk me around and gaslight me, but I was pretty frank. I was like, look, I've already triaged myself. I do have a doctorate. I am a pelvic PT. Don't tell me that, it, that this is nothing, and this is what needs to happen. Fortunately, uh, I had a great group of um, you know, providers 
that listened. And yeah, and I told them, no, you're not going to be able to diagnose me with endometriosis. So I'm not seeking for that. I'm also not seeking pain meds. I want to make sure that it's nothing catastrophic. Otherwise, let me go home and I will deal with this on my own. But the thing about the ED visit was uh, it was over $8,000. And what did I walk away with? Oh, we can't diagnose endo. Yes, I know that. Only a scope can, only laparoscopic surgery and a biopsy can. Um, so you'll still get treated like an ignorant, you know, person, even when I front load the information and tell them how, you know, endo is diagnosed. But that's not the point. The point is the cost. It's crippling. Then I missed, I was up all night in the ED, which means you can't function. I can't go see patients the next day. So then I end up canceling two days of patience. That's not okay. I have to see my people. I love my patients. I love my practice. And many of those people that I see have endometriosis. They have IC. They have the whole voice to pelvic floor sequela. And it's important, important that I'm in there helping them. And so I can't miss that. So I'm hoping that this helps. I am hoping that at the same time, endometriosis isn't found, although knowing my genetic history, it probably will be, but I hope they don't find it. And at the same time, the pain has been so crippling and debilitating and I never talk about it. I've never talked about it. This is the first time. The pain is so crippling and expensive that you can't not want something to be found. So you, it's, you're not winning either way. If they don't find something, that's concerning. Um, I, I tend towards growing adhesions is what I've been told. But were they really adhesions? I had a second appendectomy. Was it really? A leftover stump of the appendix? Was it really? I'll never know. Because I had multiple surgeries that were never, they were never biopsied. They were never really differentially diagnosed. And leading up to those surgeries, the amount of gaslighting I received, even to get that care, was insane. Maybe I'll talk more about that later. But it was insane. It was dangerous. It was threatening my health and my life. I was dropping weight. I couldn't eat. Many of you have probably looked at me over the years and gone, God, she's so thin. Well, there you go. When your gallbladder is dead and covered in adhesions and your entire abdominal wall is covered in adhesions and they won't listen until your gallbladder is uh, 6% functioning, I believe, on the scan then it's hard to eat. That went on for nearly two years. So this isn't a um, pity party video. You know, this is just one of those rough days that lots of women don't talk about when they have these issues. These issues being endometriosis or something like that. Uh, it, it could just be grotesque, nasty adhesions growing everywhere. We just don't know. But... Um, don't second get your guess yourself is my is my want and wish for you. Don't second guess yourself. Don't stop talking about that what is bothering you with the pelvis, with digestion, with breathing, with your low back and sacral area. Don't stop talking about it until you get relief. And if you're not getting relief, reach out. We have a lovely network of very talented providers in pelvic health throughout the country that I'm plugged into. I will help you find help. You're not alone. And that's all I wanted to say. You're not alone.